Hi, my name is Mark Stevens, author of Adventures in Legal Land. My website is adventuresinlegalland.com, and I also do a radio show called the No State Project on the Republic Broadcast Network on every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time. What I want to talk about today, I've spoken about it a bit on the on the radio show. I have an article. Uh, it's a standing cross-reference. Also, if you go to the website, you, there's an article about how bureaucrats never have a case. So, what I want to discuss today is is just standing in court. I want to discuss just the criminal side because the, the few critics that have uh, people have come out and said, oh, Mark is full of crap, oh, that's ridiculous, well, well everything you cite on, on the website has to do with civil cases, has no application in criminal cases. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're just going to talk about criminal cases because recently, and I don't want to know anything that I advocate the taking of drugs, I don't drink, smoke, uh, I don't even take an aspirin. I, I just not my thing. I just don't think that you should have swarm, you know, stormtroopers coming, you know, beating your house down, you know, beating the doors down to your house in the middle of the night with machine guns, and uh, because they're looking for drugs. Well, heaven forbid you should have a couple of ounces of cocaine or a few ounces of marijuana, or whatever drug you have. Oh, that's reason to have uh, an armed raid on your house. So the, if recently, the Department of Justice, which of course is uh, well, there's a word-to-lie ratio there of, I think it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, recently, they've come out and say that the United States government incarcerates more people per capita than any other government. That there's over 2.2 million people in jail. And, over tw and according to the Department of Justice, over 20% of those people, which is almost half a million, are in dr jail for drug charges nonviolent drug offenses. And no, I don't consider the fact that somebody is selling marijuana with a handgun a violent drug offense. Uh, if he takes the gun out and shoots somebody or threatens, that's a different story. 20%. And if that's not outrageous, if that's not enough to, to just make your blood boil or say there's something seriously wrong here, then maybe this information uh, is, is what you need. And when you find out that it's not just 500,000 people that are in jail, for drug offenses, but when you find out and you go to lead the legal end of it, and you find out there's no legal justification for those half a million people to be in jail, whoa, if that's not enough to make your blood boil and start taking action and to, and, and to, to help these people or, uh, or to, to, to take some kind of nonviolent uh, action, uh, then, then nothing will. Uh, half a million people and there's several hundred thousand on their way to, uh, there now, uh, not even taking into account all the people that are murdered by police departments, uh, police officers, uh, when they go serve their no-knock warrants and they bust into the wrong house and they shoot whoever happens to be there. It happens all too often. You can just do a Google search and you can find out. So we're going to see, do I, you know, what, what are the legal grounds to say that all these drug charges are totally unfounded, that there's no legal basis whatsoever. What I like to do is, and I point out uh, that I'm a babbling idiot, I'm not an attorney, and if you show this video to an attorney, uh, more than likely they'll say Mark is an idiot, he's taking things out of context, he, uh, he's reading things that have no application whatsoever, uh, he's twisting words, he's, he's, he's just putting a spin on it, uh, but if you go to my website, adventuresinlegalland.com, you can verify everything I'm saying. Then, uh, then if you take that material to an attorney, they can accuse you. <laughs> This is what attorneys do. See, mo a lot of people will go through and they'll see the information and say, well, if that's true, why aren't defense attorneys using this information to get their clients off of drug charges? Well, the reason is that the drug war, the so-called drug war, which is not a war on drugs, it's a war against people who use drugs, it's a trillion dollar business. Okay, you, you, it's not just the prison system that's making billions and billions of dollars. It is the local prosecutors, it's the police departments. Uh, I don't even have the time to get into the forfeiture laws where uh, if the police department goes in and they can seize an entire house because it's being used as a meth lab or you, legally under Bennis versus Michigan, the United States Supreme Court has ruled for 200 years if there's marijuana here that the, the, all the property the house, the property, regardless of who owns it, is all forfeited to the police department. Oh yeah, the state. But all that money stays with the police department. So they have a vested economic interest in the drug war, uh, just in forfeitures alone. Which if you look, the statistics from government, 7 out of 10 forfeiture cases never have charges filed. So, think about that one. 
So what I don't want to do is I want to go through uh, something that an attorney or a prosecutor or a judge, anyone in the, who profits from the drug war is not going to go through this. But I want to see if, if someone's going to be convicted, what's the jurisdiction of the court? Well, how do you determine the jurisdiction of the court? Well, don't ask a judge because they don't believe that their jurisdiction is limited at all, that they're these little gods that wear these black robes and uh, uh, they can do whatever they want. And that's true because they have the guns. But we're talking about the legal basis. And attorneys may turn around and, or prosecutors or whatnot, they may turn around and say, oh, Mark is wrong, he's full of, full of this. You know, that's just not the way it's done. And you know what? They're absolutely right. It's, this is not the way it's done. So, it, but this is the way the law reads. So, uh, keep that in mind when we when we start going through this. Now, if you look in the Declaration of Independence, which is supposed to be why this country was founded, it states that governments, and this is meaning American governments in particular, are unlike the the Russian government or the Chinese government, was founded for one purpose: that to secure these rights, the Declaration of Independence says, governments are instituted among men. Now, this is restated. Uh, for those skeptics, which is good, who may say, well, the Declaration of Independence has no legal bearing whatsoever. Well, that, is it wrong? Is that not why the government was established? Well, if, if it wasn't established to protect rights, then you need to start explaining something, especially since the whole basis of the power to tax is protection, that the, they're reciprocal. So, let's look at why the government was created, uh, uh, as far, and we'll look at the constitutions. Uh, the Constitution of New York, the original one, 1777, this is linked on my website in the standing cross-reference, they adopted the entire, New York, uh, the New York Constitution adopted the entire Declaration of Independence as part of the Constitution. So, uh, to say it has no legal standing whatsoever uh, is just ridiculous, uh, unless, of course, the Constitution has no legal standing, but that's a whole other episode. So, I'm going to read from Arizona. This is Article 2, Section 2. And when I go through, I'm... Everything is on the website, so if I don't give you an, a citation, you know, you can get on the website. You go to Article 2, Section 2 of the Arizona Constitution, and it says very clear and unambiguous. You don't need to be a jurist doctor, you don't need to have a law degree, you don't need to be a practicing anything to understand this. Very simple, and if you've graduated fifth grade, you can understand this. It says all political power is inherent in the people. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole show. And governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed and are established to protect and maintain individual rights. Let me read that again. Established to protect and maintain individual rights. Now, that's the government. So you have what they, you know, they said there's three branches of government. You have the legislative, executive, and judicial parts of the government. All three branches are, if they have jurisdiction, which of course it's all a scam anyway, but for our purposes today, if they have jurisdiction, then it is limited, of course, to protecting and maintaining individual rights, because that's why the government was created. So this is what the jurisdiction of the court is going to be. The jurisdiction of the courts in Arizona and anywhere else, uh, as you'll see it's all the same, is limited to protecting and maintaining individual rights. So, we go, I'm going to move on to the court cases just to show that this is very consistent. Uh, the court cases are all consistent. The law is consistent, but in practice, we're going to see it's not. If, the, if it was consistent in practice, you wouldn't have half a million people in jail for drug offenses. You certainly wouldn't have people in jail for traffic offenses. You couldn't even have a traffic court. From the Arizona Supreme Court, which I believe is a legal authority, and even if I just read one case, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of cases all saying the exact same thing. Uh, attorneys just love their precedent. Show me the legal authority. Well, here you go. They're from the Arizona Supreme Court, State v. Wilson. It says, the corpus delecti has as its two elements. I'm going to keep that in mind. We're going to see a pattern developing here. Two elements that a certain result has been produced and that some person is criminally responsible for the act. You see, the whole of court cases and the whole idea of passing laws and, and executing the laws, you know, you know, like with the police department and having courts, it all revolves around causation. Somebody caused something. So if you see here in the Arizona Supreme Court saying that a certain result has been produced in somebody's act, so you have two different things, like I said, there's two elements. You have the act, which is separate from the result. 
The act is where you do something and then what you did caused a result. Remember causation. We're going to get into that in some of these other cases. So look at a drug case, for example. Let's just imagine, now remember, I don't do drugs and I don't advocate the use of drugs, all hypothetical. But let's just imagine I have a huge crop of marijuana or hemp or reefer uh, growing out in the backyard. That's the act that I'm growing plants called marijuana or hemp. I'm just growing it at this point. What is the result? You keep that in mind as we start going through this. Now, attorneys will also say, or judges, lawyers, whatever, prosecutors, that American jurisprudence, which it is a legal encyclopedia, and they'll say that's, that, that has no legal bearing whatsoever. That's not a legal authority. Well, it's not true. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the citations way too long. I'm going to read from American Jurisprudence 2nd Edition, and it's Evidence Section 1476. Everything in American Jurisprudence, this legal encyclopedia, all of it, think of it as they've clipped together Supreme Court rulings, not dicta, okay? All they do is they take these rulings and they clip them together for different subjects, and here we're talk they're talking about evidence, and this is what the every Supreme Court has said. The corpus delecti of a crime consists of two elements, the fact of the injury or loss or harm, and two, the existence of criminal agency as its cause. I just want to point out that corpus delecti is Latin for body of a crime. It, it's the crime itself. So you can see, like not having a driver's license, where's the body of the crime? There is none. And then if we get into the technical, a legal aspect of a corpus delecti. You'll see in the criminal case, in a traffic case such as no driver's license or failure to produce identification. Oh my gosh! You'll see that the two elements are gone. There are no, it, it, they're just not there. You have the fact of the injury or loss or harm, and two, the existence of criminal agency as its cause. Well, obviously, if there's no injury, there's no cause. You haven't caused anything. So, not having identification in and of itself, is it a crime? No! How could it possibly be a crime? Oh, the, oh well, uh, uh, that doesn't apply in every court. Oh, wait a moment. We'll go through those cases that applies in every criminal case. And remember, the Constitution says that the government was established to protect and maintain individual rights. Now, if I don't give my identification to a police officer, how can it be a crime for not doing so? Whose rights have I violated? Does the police officer have a right to look at my identification? Hmm, even if he did, corpus delecti requires two elements, loss, harm, or injury. There's no harm, there's no damage. Maybe to his ego, maybe because I didn't, I didn't bow down to his authority, but I don't think you can really have a cause of action or a crime because your ego is bruised. I don't think so. Move on, uh, corpus delecti consists of Two elements, proof, direct or circumstantial, that specific loss or injury occurred and that someone's criminality is cause of loss or injury. See? That's Missouri. We'll go to Utah. Corpus delecti rule states that person, some person may not be convicted of crime if no independent evidence outside the defendant's own statements exist. To satisfy doctrine, state must produce independent evidence that injury or harm specified in crime occurred and that injury or harm was caused by someone's criminal activity. That's uh, State v. Archuleta, 850 Pacific 2nd, on page 1241. Move on to Connecticut. Corpus delecti consists of occurrence of a specific kind of loss or injury embraced in crime charged rather than commission of crime charged by someone. We'll go to Louisiana, which is absolutely notorious for corruption. I love the name of this case, State vs. Outlaw. Uh, it's 485 Southern Report, 2nd edition, page 221. Corpus delecti, the body or substance of crime, is composed of two elements. Occurrence of an unlawful injury and illegal conduct causing that injury. Go to Indiana. 
state must produce corroborating evidence of corpus delicti, showing that injury or harm constituting crime occurred and that injury or harm was caused by someone's criminal activity. That's 567, Northeast Report, 2nd edition, on page 121. And we go to California, well known for drug <laughs> putting people in jail. I think California statistically has more people in prison than some states in Europe. It says, in every prosecution for crime, let me read that again. In every prosecution for crime, that includes traffic, drugs, gun possession, uh, like not having a license to carry a firearm, okay? In every prosecution for crime, it is necessary to establish the corpus delecti, i.e. the body or elements of the crime. I want to point out that in American jurisprudence, the Supreme Courts have also ruled as an element of the crime, there must be sufficient proof of both elements of the corpus delecti beyond a reasonable doubt. No, you have to prove the injury beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, officer, let's see. I have 60 kilos worth of marijuana here in my garage. Where's the injury? Oh, see, to have probable cause for a crime, to have probable cause, the officer has to basically believe that a crime is about to be committed or has been committed. And he has to have, has to have and, and to question me, he has to have reasonable, articulable suspicion which means he has to be able to articulate the crime. What is a crime? Well, a crime consists of two elements. It is an act that causes loss, harm, or injury. And the causation has to be premeditated. It has to be that you knew it was going to cause injury. And remember, the, Calif the, the Supreme Court and, and the Constitution says the government is to protect and maintain what? Individual rights. So if I have 60 kilos worth of marijuana in my garage, which I don't, but if I had 60 kilos worth of marijuana in my garage, whose rights am I violating and where's the damage? Oh, but Mark, that's just the Constitution. That's just why we have government. Well, you know, the funny thing is, and that, this is why I don't want anyone emailing me and calling me a conspiracy theorist. Uh, most people, and if, you've, if you listen to the archive of my shows, most people and bureaucrats don't understand why we even have government in the first place. So, most of them are honestly thinking they're doing a good thing. So please, spare me the conspiracy theory nonsense. Let's move on to Michigan, which is absolutely notorious for life sentences for marijuana possession. That's right, possessing marijuana in Michigan, or connected to someone in Michigan, can get you a life sentence. And here, the law in Michigan, same as everywhere else, in People v. Swift, 470 Northwest 2nd, page 492, corpus delecti, meaning body or substance of crime charged, involves two elements. Injury, which is penally proscribed, and unlawfulness of some person's conduct in causing the injury. Amazing. Again, two elements. Injury, which is penally proscribed, and of the tens of thousands of people sitting in prison in Michigan, how many of them on drug charges, were ever accused of an injury. Think about that one. Simple possession of marijuana. Let's move on to New Jersey. The term corpus delecti embraces occurrence of loss or injury and criminal causation thereof. There's that word again, causation. So you see, it, it, it's the same wherever you go. It, it doesn't matter if it's New Jersey, New York, Louisiana, California, Oregon, Washington. Even in the Virgin Islands, if you check my website, you'll see. Even in the Virgin Islands, because the United States government, even there requires a corpus delecti. Let's move on to Hawaii. Corpus delecti of any particular crime, any, so it's not excluding drugs. And even, even so, the Constitution, government was established to what? Protect and maintain individual rights. Corpus delecti of any crime means actual commission of crime by someone, and it may, it's made up of two elements. That is, a certain result has been produced, and some person is criminally responsible for the act. There you go. Pennsylvania. The two elements of corpus delecti, who would have guessed that it's two elements? The two elements of corpus delecti are that loss or injury has occurred and that loss or injury occurred through criminal agency. 
That's Commonwealth versus Reland, 471 Atlantic 2nd, page 491. We go to Illinois. Occurrence or, of injury or loss, and it's, you know it now, come on, causation, you got it, by criminal conduct or turn to corpus delecti. Alabama. Corpus delecti consists of two elements, that a certain result has been produced, that some person is criminally responsible for the act. I mean, he wasn't an accident. Let's move to Washington. Now, Washington has the exact same uh, section of the Constitution as Arizona, where it says that the government was established to protect and maintain individual rights. And if you say it doesn't apply in Texas, then why was that government created? Oh, the Arizona government was created uh, for a different purpose than the Texas government. Pure nonsense, and you'll only get that from people who have a vested interest, whether it's economic or emotional, in the system. So we see corpus delecti consists of injury or loss in someone's criminal act which caused it. That's State versus Espinoza, 774, Pacific 2nd, 1177, a quote is on 1182. Tennessee, corpus delecti of crime requires showing that certain result has been produced, and that result was created through criminal agency. Massachusetts, Commonwealth vs. Ruddick, 520 Northeast Edition, 2nd, well, Northeast Report, 2nd Edition, page 501. Criminal responsibility is imposed on the basis of the intentional doing of an act with awareness of the probability that the act will result in substantial damage, regardless of whether the injury turns out to be minor or insignificant. And we go back to Missouri, because I like what this says, State First Davis, 797, Southwest 2nd, page 560. It says, to prove guilt of any crime, I'm going to repeat that, just for those skeptics out there. To prove guilt of any crime, State must, it's mandatory, must first demonstrate the crime's corpus delecti, or body of crime, consisting of what? How many elements? Two, big surprise there. That loss or injury charge has occurred and that someone's criminal agency caused loss or injury. That's State versus Davis. And here we go to the federal court, in case some people are thinking, well, it doesn't apply to the federal court, you jerk, Mark. Component parts of every crime. I'm going to read it again. U.S. v. Shunk, 881, Federal 2nd, page 917. The quote is on 919. This is the Circuit Court of Appeals. The uh, federal government, 10th Circuit out of Utah. Component parts of every crime are the occurrence of a specific kind of injury or loss, somebody's criminality, a source of the loss, and the accused identity as the doer of the crime. The first two elements are what constitutes the concept of corpus delecti, that being a specific kind of injury or loss, and somebody's criminality as the source. We go to United States versus Eccles, 222 Federal 2nd, page 144, the quote is on page 155, also the 10th Circuit. Most American courts take the view that the phrase corpus delecti includes, first, the fact of an injury or a loss, and secondly, the fact of somebody's criminality, in contrast to an accident as the cause of the injury or loss. And then there's Sandez versus United States, which is 239 Federal 2nd, page 239, and the quote's on page 244, which is the Ninth Circuit out of California, and they basically say the same thing as uh, U.S. versus uh, Ec Eccles, Eccles, I guess, and uh, it includes the Federal Circuit, uh, the Second Circuit, the Third Circuit, Fifth Circuit, Seventh Circuit, Ninth Circuit, and Tenth Circuit. And I would imagine that if the Supreme Court, that those, all, all those circuits were in error, they would have corrected that a long time ago. Some may be saying, hey, uh, we don't have that section of the Constitution, Mark. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the, why the government was created or it was ambiguous. So, uh, you know, every Constitution has what is called the, uh, the Judicial Power Clause, where the judicial power is given to the courts. And you go to California, it is Article 6, Section 1. You go to like, so Ohio, for example, it's Article 4, Section 1. In Oklahoma, it's Article 3, Section 1. And if you look at the definition of judicial power, it's going to it's going to mimic what we're already going through. It's going to be consistent. And uh, we're going to re uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a couple of cases here. Okay, we have the definition of judicial power given by Judge Cooley in his work on constitutional limitations held by this court 
to be sufficiently accurate for the purposes of the question then before the court, which was in substance the same as that now on the consideration, is as follows. The power which adjudicates upon and protects the rights and interests of individual citizens and to that end construes and applies the law. Now, before any, you know, skeptics say, hey, our attorneys, hey, Judge Cooley may have been a judge, but his work on constitutional limitations has no legal bearing whatsoever. Well, when the Illinois Supreme Court says that the definition is sufficiently accurate and, they, and it's a part of their ruling, and then it's mimicked in many other cases, holding that this is what the judicial power is, then that is, unless, of course, the Illinois Supreme Court is not a legal authority anymore. And it may not be. But you can find that in People vs. Chase, Northeast Reports, page 454, and the quote is on page 458. It's also quoted in People vs. Bruner, 175, Northeast, uh, page 400. Well, we go to Michigan. Wow, big surprise, Michigan. To, uh, the judicial power is uh, to adjudicate upon and protect the rights and interests of individual citizens, and to that end, to construe and apply the laws. Is the is the province of the Judicial Department. Wow, big surprise. Let's see, California. Judicial power generally is the power to adjudicate upon the legal rights of persons and property. Why was the government created? Oh, uh, I remember it saying, right. oh, that's right, it was created to protect and establish, uh, protect and maintain individual rights. So it's all consistent. This is the rhetoric now. This is not how they actually do things in practice, which is the problem. If we go down to Ohio. Um, it's 182 Northeast 489, page 491. I can't even give you the whole, I can't pronounce this. It's just Lake Improvement Association versus Lazier. It's judicial power, on the other hand, is authority to hear and determine where the rights of persons or property are the subject matter of adjudication. There you go. I don't have a debt. I'm just walking down the street and a cop asks me for identification and I don't have it. Or I'm the passenger in a car and he asks for identification and I don't have it. You go to jail and you're convicted for failure to produce identification. Whose rights have I violated? No one. Where's the damage? There is none. Not a crime. In Oklahoma, the judicial power here conferred by the Constitution is the power to hear and determine those matters which affect the life, liberty, and property of the citizens of the state. Now, I have six, again, I have got 60 kilos worth of cocaine in my garage. Or I have a, a huge field of marijuana growing out there. How does that affect the life, liberty, or property of anybody else? If you can't figure that out, and you've got half a million people sitting in prison because that's what they did, they were growing marijuana, then question why in the world are they in jail? Because it's a business. It's a lot of money. It's a multi-billion or probably a trillion dollar business. It's a multi-billion dollar business in each state. So times each one, times 50 billion by 50. And then you have the feds, my gosh. And then you have here, I know they'll say, oh, Mark, uh, a Black's Law Dictionary, that's, that's not a legal authority. Well, you know, when you go back far enough, Black's Law Dictionary, like American jurisprudence, just used Supreme Court rulings. Rulings, not dicta. They used rulings, which are part of the law, for their definitions. So here you have judicial power, and this is from Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. You won't get this in the latest one. Uh, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, page 586. It says, uh, judicial powers, power that adjudicates upon and protects the rights and interests of persons or property, and to that end declares, construes, and applies the law. And they're quoting you know, from uh, Henry Hunstiger, which is 130 Minnesota Reports, page 474. You have People X. Rel. Roosh. Verse White, which is 334, uh, the Illinois Reports, page 465, and Henry Assessment of Kansas City Southern Railroad Company, which is 168, Oklahoma Reports, page 495. So uh, when the Supreme Court lays down a ruling, attorneys believe that is the law, so it is consistent. So you, this is just a small sampling. Uh, you go to the website, VenturesLegalLand.com, you can get... Uh, more I have on the standing cross reference. I have this information for all 50 so-called states. It's all the same thing. It's all the same. And as you've seen, California people versus Lopez for every crime in every prosecution for crime that includes drugs. That's what people are sitting in jail in every prosecution. I don't see any 
exceptions. Oh, but it doesn't apply to drug cases. But Mark, how do you expect them to prosecute people for these drug charges? That's not my job. Given information to show that whatever the motive, the people sitting in jail for drug charges should not be there. This is why rapists are getting out. People who are armed robbers are getting out on parole and whatnot because they, they have to make room for all these drug offenses. When you look at when you look at the actual law, you can't support a drug case. You cannot. It's a different story if somebody was shot. That's not a drug case. That's a murder. That's a homicide. Or that's a, it's an attempted, attempted murder. It's not a drug case. When you look at these possession, so we're going to go through it just in summary. Gun was created to protect, protect and maintain individual rights. For every crime, there must be a corpus delecti because that's the crime itself. That consists of two elements. It consists of loss, harm, or injury in somebody's criminal causation that they intended to cause this. So you, you basically have the violation of a legal right that causes loss, harm, or injury. That's your crime. Uh, the only thing that separates a crime from a tort is that the tort is considered the violation of a legal right that belongs to the whole community as opposed to just an individual, which is pure nonsense in and of itself. So let's, let's just examine a drug case for, uh, for a moment. Uh, like again, I've got a huge field of marijuana in my backyard. All I'm doing is growing it. I'm not, that, that's all the stage we're at here right now. And I'm arrested, you know, because they, they have the helicopter go over the house, they see it, the men, uh, you know, with the flak jackets, the, the, the masks, they come in with their machine guns, and they, they do their bust, and they, they take all the whatever, and uh, I'm put on trial. Is there legal ground? All I've done is grow marijuana on my property. I'm not growing it on yours, I'm not growing it on my neighbors. That's all I'm doing. Is there a crime? Well, where's the corpus delecti? Two elements, the fact of injury, loss, or harm. You don't have any loss, injury, or harm, so there is no crime. There cannot be a drug possession crime. There isn't one. So, there is no crime for possession of drugs. You could call it a crime, you can legislate it, but that doesn't make it a crime. A crime is a specific thing. Corpus delecti. It's an injury with causation. Uh, so just because I call you, uh, I can call you a child, or even treat you like a child, doesn't make you a child. So it doesn't matter what some exalted legislator calls it. It's not a crime. Neither is not giving a dedication to a police officer not a crime. Okay? Uh, it just isn't. Unless you have those two elements, not a crime. In fact, you can even look up the definition of crime. It's something that it, 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 it has to cause an injury. Uh, that's just the way it is. So, to recap, I think what's important is to get this information out, get it to your friends, neighbors, especially somebody who may be involved in a drug case. But don't count on your attorney or their attorney bringing this information in. They make their life blood. I mean, they make their living. They're going to be retiring on by, by putting people or by helping to put people in prison. So, they're, going to be, they're probably very reluctant to bring this down and say, oh, it doesn't apply to a drug case. Show me where it doesn't apply. How could it not? The government was created to establish, was established to protect and maintain individual rights. Uh, if you're operating under the Constitution, I think that would apply. But you see, there's the rub. It's got nothing to do with the Constitution. This is just all sick rhetoric. Make you think that they're there to do these things. They're not. They absolutely are not. So a judge is not going to, or a defense attorney, definitely, well, maybe a defense attorney, but definitely not a judge. is not going to say, well, Mr. Prosecutor, i got to admit this is a zealous prosecution. Uh, I don't like this individual any more than you do, but I don't see a corpus delecti here. Uh, according to the Supreme Court, which I'm supposed to follow, uh, there's got to be two elements here. Occurrence of an unlawful injury, yeah, I don't see an injury, so I don't see a crime here. But imagine people getting educated or on a jury saying, excuse me, um, you got a wonderful system here. It's, it's such a fantastic system of justice, you have to threaten the jurors to actually come in. Uh, yeah, that's right. You, you're, you go to jail if you don't show up for jury duty. It's, it's such a wonderful thing. such a great system. But 
be that as it may, uh, since I'm here, sir, I don't see a corpus delecti here. How? Why are you wasting my time? I could be at work. I could be at home eating cereal. I could be doing anything else than being in this courtroom. Why are we here when there's no corpus delecti? This should have been thrown out immediately. That's what needs to happen. Juror is actually saying, wait just a minute here. So this is why prohibition was, was eventually repealed, because people wouldn't convict. So to sum up and close, there's no crime unless somebody's rights are involved and that there's been damage caused. You violate someone's legal rights and you cause damage. Uh, You've got to have those two things. And just like they said in People vs. Lopez, in every prosecution for crime, it is necessary to establish the corpus delecti, i.e. the body or elements in the crime. You don't have the damage, you don't have a crime, period. doesn't matter how against drugs you are. And I'm against, I don't think anybody should take drugs. I, I don't need to take aspirin or an ibuprofen or anything. It, that's not the, it's not the point. The point is, you want to prosecute someone for a crime, there has to be a crime. And my name is Mark Stevens, website is Adventures in Legal Land, and remember, if government was actually there and they were interested in protecting your life, liberty, and property, they wouldn't be the first ones to threaten to take it away from you.